Hello, this is Mr. Young with Anatomy and Physiology at Glacier High School. Today we focus on photoreception or how you detect light in your eye, the physiology of vision. To begin, we really need to spend a moment to look at the major anatomical parts that are going to be associated with the process of perceiving light. And as our diagram shows, we can find light that will come and pass through this transparent portion of our outer tunic, referred to as the cornea of the sclera. And then as it continues into the aqueous through the pupil and interacts with the crystalline lens, the light then gets refracted in such a way where it will at some point arrive at some area on the posterior segment of what we refer to as the retina shown in yellow. Here in the retina, we're going to look at some very special cells that have the ability to, when the appropriate wavelength of light arrives, send a message to the brain that says, light has been detected. Namely, the cells here are the ones we'll focus on, shown in yellow and purple, rods and cones. Somehow, we have to get them excited. We have to get them activated in such a way where they will send a message down to these cells in pink referred to as bipolar cells. These are again neurons. And then those have to relay the message to these ganglion cells which have collectively their root fibers that will come and proceed through the optic disc into the optic nerve into the brain. As we zoom into the rods and the cones, we find them embedded in what will be an area lining the inside of the eye, lining the retina. So far we've seen that tissues that line things are epithelial tissues, and this is no different. This is a retinal epithelium that contains a nucleus shown here, and then various pigment molecules. Those pigment molecules, of course, are melanin, the same stuff that makes your skin the color that it is. These melanin molecules serve a purpose in preventing light from scattering within the eye and really messing up your vision. So we want them there. It's good that they're there. This epithelial tissue is not nourished, however, by direct feed of blood supply. Rather, it must receive nutrients by way of diffusion from the vascular layer, the choroid that lies beneath. And that's why when we've talked about, for example, a detached retina, if this tissue gets detached and pulls away from the choroid tissue beneath, we have big problems. That tissue will die because there's no longer the ability to get by diffusion the nutrients from the blood supply of the choroid. So here we have our rods and cones embedded within. We want to begin by looking at structural and functional differences in these two cell types. Structurally, you can see that there's a different shape in what we refer to as the outer segment or the OS shown here in our diagram of each cell type. That's really where the name comes from. A conical outer segment for our cones, a rod-like outer segment for our rods. So the shape is really what defines them by name. They have very similar other parts. An inner segment, which is an area that's chock full of mitochondria. Those will play a key role later in the regeneration of some of our key molecules that are involved in light detection. And finally, we have down here an area where the nucleus will reside of this cell body. And lastly, toward the end, we have a location referred to as the synaptic terminal. And so we have a unidirectional flow of information that's going to be in this direction, where if this cell detects light, it will eventually have to relay it down across a synaptic cleft to a receiving end of another neuron. That other neuron we'll find later is this bipolar neuron shown here in white. And the mechanism by which this occurs is through chemical means that are called neurotransmitters. Pay close attention to the term neurotransmitter in our discussion today because it's going to come up right at the end and I want you to recall this diagram right here. Neurotransmitters are a way in which these cells communicate with one another. Functionally, we also see some major differences in these cells, though. 
first, for cones, we can remember that just as it starts with the C, they are responsible in detecting color. Rods, on the other hand, instead of detecting color, are there to detect light in really a dim or a dark light situation. So your ability to detect motion and light in the evening time, when there's very little light, is facilitated by your rods. In addition to the structural and functional differences, we find the overall distribution of rods and cones to vary significantly. If you consider our diagram, which shows the fovea centralis represented by zero degrees on our scale, and you continue temporally or laterally in the eye, you find that the amount of cones in that area will show a sharp decrease. The pictures really tell it all as well. Look at the high concentration of cones or color detecting cells at the area of the fovea. However, as you extend laterally, that density decreases and you get rather a high density of now rods. Similarly, as you proceed uh, medially in your body or toward the nose, you see a likewise rise in your rods as you continue to the periphery of your eye and a sharp decrease in cones. You can apply this then to those times in which you are focusing on something straight ahead of you and you see color wonderfully and yet out of the corner of your eye you detect motion. You may not be able to perceive the color of that movement or the color of the object that's making that motion, but you may at least detect that there is something there. You detect the light, you detect the motion, but you don't see the color. That's all because of your rods and where they're located. Compare that to our diagram and you can see the comparison very clearly. Here you note in green our peak of cones this is the area shown here as the fovea centralis, which is central to the macular region in your eye. Again, this is the posterior of your retina. This diagram or picture is taken with an ophthalmoscope shining a light uh, into your eye and through that pupil. As you proceed, however, uh, laterally, either nasally or temporally, you find cone distribution diminishes and the density of rods increases sharply such that if you are to have light that focuses here you will have a great opportunity to at least detect there's something there but the fact that there is very few there are few cones suggests that your ability to detect color will not be high so as we consider how really do you detect light we're gonna pay close attention to right now only the rod and this rod cell shown here with its outer segment particularly this diagram blows up the outside of our rod cell to show the phospholipid bilayer characteristic of cell membranes with an embedded transmembrane protein shown in blue. This is like a little doorway into the cell. And like most doors, this also has a key. It turns out that to maintain an open flow of sodium and other ions like calcium into my cell, there has to be a key present that will keep it open. That key shown here as CGMP stands for cyclic guanosine monophosphate or cyclic GMP we'll refer to it from here on out its presence allows for this port or this ligand gated ion channel to remain open so let's consider now the discs that are internal to my rod these membranous sacs or referred to as discs here in our diagram contain in their own membrane this large purple molecule. This large purple molecule is a protein referred to as opsin combined to a pigment seen here as retinol and collectively we refer to it as rhodopsin. So rhodopsin is this complex molecule found in the membrane of the sacs that are internal to the rods only in the outer segment that you see here. This peach colored in our diagram retinol molecule has a unique shape that allows it to bind to the structural protein shown within these alpha helices and other uh, structures here of myopsin protein. This is how it exists when it's in the dark condition, when there's very low light. Shown here is the actual structure of that retinol molecule. 
This retinal molecule is found in every cone type of the body, long, medium, and short wavelength cones. And in addition, it's found in all the rods. It's the same molecule. However, it only absorbs light of specific wavelengths, and that is totally dependent on the opsin protein that it's bound to. The opsin protein is different in each of the cones and in the rods. Here we see a special configuration of this retinol that shows uh, a carbon chain coming off of this carbon ring and showing a distinct bent towards the twelfth carbon. This bend is something that we really have to watch for. I'm going to be representing retinol in the rhodopsin state where it's bound to opsin with a configuration like this for simplicity. Carbon chain with a bend. What's most significant to us, however, is that when light is activating opsin molecule, it leads to the conformational shift of the retinol. And it results in a rotation uh, around this 12th carbon of our uh, subsequent atoms and this conformational shift leads to its detachment from opsin. It can no longer stay bound. This isomeric shift results in a trans isomer, 11 trans retinol. Shape absolutely matters because now our molecule instead of being bent is straight. This essentially starts a series of events that will ultimately lead to your brain detecting light. So let's see how that happens. Representing the membranous disks here that are found within the rod is this diagram. And our red molecule here with the little hook up top is our rhodopsin with retinol in its bent configuration. It's still bound to opsin. Next to it on the membrane is this series of G proteins referred to as transducin. And following that nearby is phosphodiesterase, another enzyme that will be activated here momentarily. So let's go ahead and initiate things by shazam, striking it with light of a specific wavelength, mind you. And as light activates rhodopsin, we see, as we mentioned before, this molecule of retinol changing its shape to a straighter series of carbons off of this ring. That initiates our G protein series here, our transducin enzyme, to activate phosphodiesterase. What exactly does it do? Well, here you see that it's taking in the molecule referred to as CGMP or cyclic GMP and it's decomposing it into guanosine monophosphate. Now where did we see this before? Hey, that's right. There it was. It was the key that unlocked the door that allowed sodium to come into the cell. Well, you take that away and you decompose it by way of PDE enzyme and all of a sudden you prevent sodium from coming in anymore. It's now shut out. Consequently, if sodium cannot come in, we see that we still have, over here in my cell, sodium that's being exocytosed, excuse me, sodium that's being transported actively with the help of ATP outside the cell. But with no sodium in, and now sodium going out, we have a hyperpolarization that occurs. Formerly, we were at a value of approximately negative 40 millivolts. And now we have hyperpolarized and are arriving at a value of approximately negative 70 millivolts. That is a huge deal to these cells. As it turns out, the hyperpolarization will lead to a change in the rate at which this rod will deliver neurotransmitters across the synaptic cleft to bipolar ganglion that are beneath. And as soon as these bipolar ganglion detect a decrease in the amount of neurotransmitters, they understand that this rod has detected light and they send an action potential to the brain. Go back to our initial diagrams and remember, here's our rod cell, here's our bipolar, here's our ganglion. Now 
hyperpolarization has occurred. These cells detect a decrease in neurotransmitters across the synaptic cleft. They send an action potential toward the ganglion. The ganglion together innervate the optic nerve. And it's off to the races, to the visual centers of the brain, telling you light has been seen.